Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and I welcome you to another edition of Books and Looks. Yes, this is our weekly voyage of discovery in the wonderful world of books, books that I've been reading and authors that I've been interviewing. And today we are really happy to have with us Jacqueline Olness. Uh, Jacqueline is a college professor who has a very interesting story to tell us about something called the fruit cure, which is a deep dive into the world of fruitarianism. I, I never heard that word until Jacqueline taught it to us, that fruitarianism and 30 bananas a day. Uh-huh. Can you imagine eating 30 bananas a day? Well, folks, there are people out there who do that, and she tells us all about that. Now, before we get to talking about that, you know, I, I often tell you that that you should refer to my website, viewsonbooks.com, if you're interested in more thorough reviews of the uh, books. But, you know, one of the things people have asked me is where can they find the books? Because a lot of these books, while they're, I think, they're spectacular books, you might not always find them at your local bookstore or wherever. So if you're interested in this book or any other book that I talk about, go to viewsonbooks.com, read the review, and then push the button if you're interested, and you can get it. Go right over to Amazon. You can get it right there on Kindle, paperback, hardback, however you want it. You can get it right there. And, you know, that's a, a good way as any to get a hold of these books. You can't always find it at your local libraries, yeah, or even over at your maybe, maybe your bookstores. So anyway, but today we talk with Jacqueline Allness about the, her, her, it started as a, a well, as so, an undiagnosed medical condition she had. And she was a college athlete. She was a long-distance runner. And she eventually had major, major issues. It got to the point where she couldn't uh, walk. She couldn't run. Uh, she kept repeating words over and over. Uh, she had it's a terrible conditions she had. And we hear about her life. And then we talk about the story of the fruit cure. Now, Jacqueline lets us know that she did not participate in the fruit cure, but she examined that because... You know, she tells us that people, when they are desperate for a cure and modern medical science does not have all the answers, they start going online. Yep, they go online. And God knows what you're going to find in that cesspool of social media, YouTube, Instagram, whatever, Facebook. Trust me, <laughs> it's not that great, folks. And so she did this going, I think, around 2010 or 2012, and she found the fruit cure. And she talks us all about being a fruitarian and what that means. We even talk to the fact that vegetarians and fruitarians uh, are basically, uh, well, they're really not homeless for, for people of color. That's right. It's basically a white person thing. We talk about body images also. But we talk about these two people called Freely and Dorian Ryder and what they're doing to promote this 30 bananas a day. We learn about Banana Island. You know, we get a lot of stuff here. So you know what? This is a lengthy interview, and I can't do justice to all she's going to talk to us about. So without any further ado, let's go right into that interview with Jacqueline Allness. Jacqueline, welcome to Books and Looks. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, we are very happy to have you here. I think your book is it's coming out in the very next few days, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think it's coming out January 23rd. Okay. So that's right around the corner. And I think people want to get this book because this is loaded with great information and facts. And uh, I, I'll tell you, I the minute I got it, I couldn't put it down. Wonderful book. Wonderful book. Before we get into the actual book itself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Uh, and I think you ended up in Oklahoma at some time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I that's a loaded question for me, only because I moved so frequently. I... Um, grew up all over the place in the U.S. and in Indonesia. I went to high school partially in Texas and Oklahoma, and then I went to college in North Carolina, and then grad school in Oregon, and then back to Oklahoma for PhD. So I bop around quite a bit. <laughs> you certainly add. What Were your parents in the military or just like to move around a lot? Just like to move around a lot, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's all right. You know, that's a, that's good. Now, when you were in, uh, it, before you got to college, I think you had taken up uh, long distance running, if I'm not mistaken. When did you do that? So I started running in middle school because 
we did the presidential fitness test and I was a swimmer at the time, but I remember running the mile and I beat everyone in my class, boys included. And for me as a sort of nerdy <laughs> seventh grader, I thought that was the greatest thing. Um, and so I kind of started after that, just getting more into it. And we moved to Texas during my ninth grade year. And that was a way to sort of like feel like I belonged to something. And you were a swimmer prior to that. Yeah, I swam most of growing up. Wow. All right. Now, you, you got your undergraduate degree um, in, in North Carolina? Correct. Yeah. At Elon. Elon. Oh, Elon University up there. All right. And then you went to Oregon eventually. Where, where were you in Oregon? I was in Portland. I was. Yeah, I went to Portland State, which is right downtown. So it's next to the farmer's market. And it's it's kind of fun. It's right in the middle of everything. Now, you got your master's there. That would that would be it. Yes. OK. And then you say you came back to Oklahoma for your Ph.D. I did. Yeah. I went to Oklahoma State. Oh, OK. Now, where what did you get your degrees in? Was it a creative writing? Was it in a, uh, something else? Yeah. Creative writing for both. So I got my MFA, um, which is like a terminal arts degree in creative writing. And then I went on to get my Ph.D. in creative writing as well. OK. Now, now, friends, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is some of the medical issues that Jacqueline has encountered over the years, which uh, led her on this uh, process of investigating and telling us all about the fruit cure. But, you know, did, did your medical problems make you ever want to go into biology or physiology or any sort of a, a science type courses? <laughs> I laugh only because um, I don't have any talent in science or in math. Um, so maybe if I had the inclination, that would have made more sense. But for me, writing has always been a way of trying to figure out the world in myself. So that's my way in. But yeah, I, I would be fascinated to know more about the science of things. Yeah, you see, that it's like the DeSantis family. We have great interest in the sciences. We know we can do none of it, however. As a matter of fact, I always tell people in my college, I went to Furman University, they barred me from the science hall. You don't even go there. And it's true. I took my I took some weird ca classes outside of the science. You know, <laughs> it didn't want me. <laughs> what but, did you end up majoring in? I made up energy political science and then going out to uh, Pepperdine out in California and got my law degree. And so then I went back home to Pennsylvania to practice for 30 years, 25 years. Yeah. So anyway, now you're because I see you're up in you're up in Westchester right now, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and you're you're a, a a college professor. Yes. Did you did you always want to do that? Um, I thought I think I always wanted to teach in some capacity. I I thought it seemed like a job that I would enjoy, but I didn't really have a goal to be a professor until probably I was in grad school or my PhD when I started to realize like I really enjoyed what I was doing. Now, The Fruit Cure, nonfiction book. Is it your first uh, book that's been published? Yes, it is. Okay. And most people who have an MFA aren't going into nonfiction. I see most of them doing very literary stuff. Are you, are you considering going into the uh, fictional categories at all? I would say after the fact-checking process I went through, yes. <laughs> but that's like half a joke, half a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. Uh, yeah. You might appreciate as a lawyer, you know, some of the things you have to go through in terms of thinking about getting sued or, you know, how you're writing phrases exactly. and how they can be taken by other people. It's really fascinating and then terrifying once you go through the process and as we all <laughs> as we all have seen in the last week or so plagiarism plays a big part in everything in our lives and got be careful true. mark it down you know so uh, wow <laughs> anyway well i'm glad you're you're coming to us today from up there in westchester and doing okay but let's talk a little bit about your medical condition which basically prompted i think this entire story you're writing about could you tell us a little bit and if it's too painful that's okay but then we won't talk about it but if you want to could you tell us a little bit about it i think the interesting part for me was i had grown up always feeling very in control of my body and very happy in my body in a lot of ways like just being an athlete i think you're really attuned to you know, how fast you're going, how strong you are, how you feel any given day. And so when I was a freshman in college, I ran. And then my second semester, I got a cough, which I thought really nothing about because you're always sick in college. You know, everyone lives in the dorms and you're always getting something or other. 
but I took a uh, medication that the athletic doctor gave to me and I collapsed soon after. And that was the start of a lot of years of trying to figure out what was going on. So my symptoms were really scary and debilitating in the sense that I would repeat phrases for minutes on end without really knowing why. I started to lose my memory of events. So I would just wake up, you know, and have to ask someone else what had happened to me while I was not okay. And so that really changed my relationship with my body and with the way that I thought about myself in the world, just because it was so unexpected and so severe. And and were you able to continue to run at all? So that was the tricky part, too. During that time, I was 18 years old, which I say out loud only because I teach 18 year olds now. And they seem so young to me. Like I look at them and they're trying to figure out what college is, who they are, what they want to do with their lives. And they're figuring out how to be independent for the first time. And so when it when it started happening to me, I feel like I tried to run because my coach and the doctors told me I should. They were like, you're fine. You're normal. Nothing's wrong with you, even though I kept having symptoms. And so I tried to run, not successfully, but it was this like sort of tug of war between what they were telling me and what I was feeling in my own body, which became really difficult. Yeah. So you were, you got to a point, if I'm remembering correctly, that you were basically, uh, had to be carried places, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. If I would have like an episode in the dining hall or something, friends would carry me home, which was, you know, it got to a not great place. But I think I was trying to live in denial that anything was actually happening to me, which is why I kept trying to stay in college and stay on the team. Well, that see, that leads me to your coach. W- was your coach in denial also? I mean, do, it, was, we, do you feel like you were getting good feedback from the coach? Not particularly. And that's another tricky one because I think a lot of what happened with my coach is sort of steeped in a larger issue, which is how Division One athletes are treated in general. I think in the U.S. at least, yeah, we have like a culture of no pain, no gain. And We have a culture of I see news articles all the time about like a football player who dies because the coach doesn't let them get water or someone who ends up breaking something in their body because their coach says play through it. And that's like something we champion at different times. And so I think less than being like my individual coach's problem, I think it was more culture problem where she said run through it because she didn't really like there was no other language to be like rest relax, chill. Like that wasn't part of division one sports, at least not at the time. It was very much like you push through anything if you're on the team. And that's, that's sort of the status quo. Now, what year was that? What, when were you, was it a year, five years ago, 10 years ago? When you... Over a decade now. Yeah. Which I'm kind of shocked by <laughs> that that much time has passed, but it has. <laughs> Well, then did she, did she refer you to a uh, the, the, the team physician or a school physician? Yeah. So I saw the athletic doctor who I would go see almost every day at that time. And he would always say that I was fine. And he told me that my symptoms were a result of medication leaving my system. How I had like an allergic reaction, he said. So I tried to trust that. And then when that didn't work, he sent me to a neurologist off campus I went to see a battery of different doctors. I saw like an eye doctor. I saw a heart doctor. I saw a variety of people during that time who took tests and all of the tests came back normal. And so I started to have this feeling that I was the one who was, you know, crazy for thinking that something was wrong with me, um, even though it clearly was. Do you feel as I'm, I read things and uh, over the internet, do you feel that uh, you were treated differently as a white female athlete as opposed to maybe a male athlete or another ethnicity? Did you, did you get any feeling of that? I think, you know, I think about it systemically and I think that there are very clear disparities in the systems that we have between how people are treated and who is believed and whose pain is not believed. And so I certainly think that those disparities were baked into my experience. I do remember one doctor writing down that he like wrote something like the patient is close to tears during this interview. 
meaning that he was just writing in the most clinical language possible that I was about to cry. And when I look at something like that, I think to myself, like, okay, you know, how much of my emotional responses in doctor's office were sort of seen as me being dramatic or too much and how much of it took me bringing in a video of my episodes for the doctor to take me seriously. And so all of my previous descriptors of what I was feeling were sort of brushed off as like, this is fine. Keep on going. And so that, I think, is something that stands out as I don't know if it's a product of gender or identity or if it was just doctors in the U.S. have 15 minutes to see you kind of thing. But I do think that there was a real lack in my experience and a real like gap there. It, it read that way. The book reads that way that you are being brushed off because you can't create this experience in front of them. And because they can't see it, they they don't know if you're telling the truth or if you're exaggerating something. And uh, I'm glad you were able to take I didn't realize you took a video along with you one time. That's good. But 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 then you were treated, I thought, rather harshly. And I do mean this harshly by your teammates and fellow students. It's, it's, a, it's like you were putting on an act in a way. And then they they tried to film you to make ridicule you. Terrible, I thought. Yeah, that was pretty terrible. <laughs> that that took me a long time to get over. I think because you feel so vulnerable when you're sick, and especially in with an illness like I had where I was losing control of you know my ability to talk and move through the world the way I, I had, I felt like it was an extra layer of pain to then feel like the people around you would treat you cruelly rather than with care. And so it's taken me a long time in my adult life to allow people to take care of me and to know that not everyone in the world is going to take advantage of me. There are a lot of people who have a lot of kindness to give. Yeah. So those people are not on your Christmas card list. <laughs> they are not. Good. Good. <laughs> uh, actually, you don't even get a Christmas postcard. No, you're out together. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. Good. Wow. Now, uh, we got to get to the fruit cure. And when I saw this, I was expecting one type of book in which you were going to extol the virtues of the fruit cure. And as we got into it, <laughs> friends, you want to hear about some wacky things that are going on out there. Jacqueline has done some superb research. And uh, tell us a little bit to begin with, what was the fruit cure? <laughs> I I want to know, too, were you disappointed when it wasn't a celebration of fruit, but a takedown instead? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I liked it because you brought out what it's like somebody today called my wife and said, oh, you know, if I take these uh, CBD gummies, I'm going to lose a lot of weight. No, you're not. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The same thing, basically. You know, I think that you're right on the money in that in that I hope that the book is not just a takedown of, you know, fruit diets, but I hope that it's like a reminder to us all that we live in a world where all around us on social media, on billboards, on advertisements on TV, from your friends, you get pitched ways to change your life on the daily. And like you said, very few of them work in the way that people tell us they should. So yeah, I'm glad you took that away. But yeah, the fruit cure, I found it. I was really sick. So it was like my second year of kind of being sick and the doctor still didn't really have definitive answers for me. And I did what a lot of us do when we're sick and we don't know what to do, which is I went to Google and I started typing in desperate stuff, you know, like, will I ever be okay again? Will I run? Just stuff that, you know, the internet cannot really answer, but you want someone to give you affirmation that it's going to be okay. And I came across a website called 30bananasaday.com and there, the founders preached that if you ate fruit and raw fruit and only fruit, you could heal yourself from anything. And so, yeah, the fruit diet is basically just eat fruit and eat fruit in abundance and you can heal yourself. Right. And I think that uh, website, 30 bananas a day dot com, I don't even think that exists anymore, does it? Yeah, you have to go back on the Wayback Machine. The so, Wayback Machine, okay. Yeah, the Wayback Machine will take you there if you want to go check it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. But, you know, that's interesting because as part of this book, Jacqueline really gives us a fine, fine overview of the history of vegetarianism and 
is it fruitism or fruitarianism? How is it, what's the proper fruitarianism, word? Fruitarianism, yeah. Fruitarianism. Yeah. Tell us a little tell us a little bit about that. Well, I got obsessed with this question of like, who is the first person to say eat 30 bananas a day? And someone else was like, yeah, that sounds smart. Because when you say it out loud to anyone, they get this look of like, you're joking, right? Because it's a little bit absurd. It's a little bit ridiculous. Um, And so I started doing research on, you know, like who eats fruit and who are these fruit eaters? And what I did was I just like, I started with Essie Honeball, who's in the book, and she has this memoir called I Live on Fruit. And she seemed to be one of the first to sort of experiment with it, at least in modern times. And then I would just follow her list of books like she cited some and then I would follow those books back further. And then I finally got back to like these pamphlets from like the early 1900s that were basically using the word fruitarianism, but not in the way that we do now, which is when I recognized like, okay, that probably meant we're starting to get there, but we're not all the way there yet. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, I guess, my process was just slowly inching my way back. Okay. So these people who are uh, doing the 30 bananas a day, they felt that fruit, but basically bananas is what you needed to, uh, to, to cure all the problems of mankind. Correct. Okay. Where were they located at? They were in Australia and they would do a lot of they did one retreat every year in Thailand. And the reason they did it there was because the fruit is really cheap, accessible, and you can get a lot of tropical fruits that you can't get other places for better prices and in more abundance than, say, Canada in the winter, for example. Did did they have a, a, a center over there that people came to them or was it all over the Internet? So they had year round, they had stuff on the Internet. So they had YouTube channels. They had Instagrams as soon as that became a platform. They had Snapchat when that became a platform. They had their 30 bananas a day forum where people could chat. And then they would also do in-person retreats. So I think you'd pay your own way and you'd get your own hotel room. But they'd meet up in this park every day and you could bike to the top of a mountain and get to hear I don't want to say sermons, but they were kind of sermons. They were like bordering on the point of like religion of like you sat at the feet of these leaders and they told you how to eat and how to live and how to be the best person you could be for yourself. That's a lot of bananas. I mean, I how does a person go about getting 30 bananas a day just to buy 30 that are ripe is difficult. I know, right? And then not letting them go bad and cycling through them and making sure and eating all of them. I can't. Yeah. Now, in in thirty bananas a day, were you allowed to have a pineapple or or a plum, or could you have any of that stuff? Yeah, you could have other fruits. They named it that because they were obsessed with this idea of mono meals, which means that you eat one type of fruit for each meal. So, like, you might eat ten mangoes for breakfast. You might eat ten <laughs> ten bananas for lunch. You know. 10 oranges for dinner, but they believed in this idea of purity, which is where the historic stuff comes in too, because it was really religious. It was intertwined with Christianity in interesting ways, but they believed that if you stuck to one specific fruit, you could purify your body even further from any sort of toxins or problems that it had. Um, So that's why they did that. You know, one of the things that, that you've done and you did uh, when you were not feeling well, and which all of us do, you, you referenced this earlier, well, you know, we start looking. You know, we're going to... My dad always used to say to me, uh, who was a lawyer also, he used to say to me, oh, I could have been the ten, 10 diagnosticians in the world. And, and I think he could have been, okay? But now everybody wants to be a top 10 diagnostician, and they're going to go to the internet, and they're going to see what can they find. And uh, this is a problem, isn't it, in, in what's out there? You don't know what's true. Yeah, it's hard. And it's it's hard because there is a gap like we've talked about so far. There is a gap sometimes between what a doctor tells you and what you need to know, where like sometimes they do leave you with questions still or they don't listen to you enough for you to feel heard. And so I totally get people who are going to these sites, me included, even if now looking back the that I went to 30 bananas a day is completely ridiculous. But in the time, it felt like I was doing something to empower myself and gain control over myself. 
in ways that I really didn't get to do in other situations. Right. Right. Well, this goes back to a, a, a Dr. Susan Wendell or Wendell. I don't know how she pronounces her name, but she's one of who wrote there that people, because of their body aches, that that's what prompts them to do all this looking. Medical science can't give them the answer. And what what, what can you do? You know, oh, there was a what? Ah, you're probably a young girl. Yeah, you were a young girl. I think I think Steve McQueen went down to Mexico to do their peach pit diet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he had cancer. He had cancer. And that was a thing. They ground up the peach pits. And then I don't know if Steve did it or not, but uh, there were a lot of people who for cancer cures went to Mexico because they couldn't get treatments here. And they're huh. searching for anything, anything to help them, you know. So, yeah, it's uh, what happened with you is no different what's happened to millions and millions of other people. They're searching. Yeah. And it happens to people in different ways. Like you see. I see on Instagram all the time, like, you know, they're selling you essential oils or a specific supplement or, you know, any number of things. And it's not that those things are bad. It's just that they might not be the answers that the people think that they are. One, one of the things that you point out to us so well in this book is this: a lot of these uh, cures or lifestyle changes or whatever are brought to us by doctor or professor. And these people aren't doctors or professors, are they? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that that was a fascinating ride to take where yeah, the the people who call themselves doctors have sometimes gone to online programs where they receive a sort of degree that allows them to call themselves a doctor or they'll misuse their title. Like, for example, I am a doctor, but would I ever get up in front of someone else and say, I'm a doctor, here's what you need to do for your diet? No, because I've never taken a nutrition class in my life. But there are certain people who don't have qualms about sort of using those labels to create a sense of authority or trust that then people do start to believe in and that becomes really murky. Like that was a really interesting thing to write into in the book to try to critique that practice without critiquing the people themselves necessarily. Right. right. Well, I, I don't refer to the, 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 the 30 bananas a day or the fruit cure as a diet. It's, it became more of a lifestyle, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're so right. You're, you were right. Because it's not just about the food itself. It's about more than that. I know the the uh, people who were involved. We'll get to them a little later, but uh, they were into long distance bicycling and all sorts of stuff. And yeah, you know, I can't imagine doing that with just bananas and yeah. mangoes in me. Just... Well, that's probably why they shifted in the end to other things. Where right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> which in itself is another interesting story we'll get to. But yeah, well, now one of the things is. We talk about the thirty, the thirty bananas a day. And it's like, you never really got on that diet. You investigated it, and I think you you tried it for a bit. You know, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I got obsessed with it, and I never became a fruitarian. I tried for one day and I failed, and I think it's because I don't like to be told what to do, which is probably my own personality failing. But I felt like stifled by even one day of it. And I craved salty stuff, so I, I caved. But I did take a lot of the rhetoric on the 30 Bananas a Day website was about toxins, evil, healing. And so I did start to take that from the website where, like, they said oil was evil, for example. And I started to believe oil was evil, even though as a 20-year-old who is, you know, highly athletic, eating olive oil is not at all a bad thing. In fact, it's something you really need. Um, and so I just developed sort of a disordered pattern of eating from being so obsessed with the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, friends, Jacqueline's in college during all this time. I mean, it's not like she's now a, a 40-year-old woman doing this. She's still maybe not even hit 20, and she's investigating this. And this is and this is what happened. So she was changing her diet, trying to find anything to help her. Because in the midst of all this, and this is what amazes me, you go back to running and you you do superbly. Yeah. <laughs> that was the hard part, too, about the illness was that it would recede from my life for a long enough time that I would start to feel like I could trust my body again. And then it would come back 
at what felt like the most inopportune times and sort of disrupt that feeling that I had. Yeah. You mentioned just a moment ago about uh, some similarities between uh, maybe uh, religion and uh, fruitarian or vegetarianism. Could, could you tell us about those parallels, what you found out? Yeah. So one thing is there's an obsession with purity. So there's this obsession with keeping your body pure from the evils of the world. And so that comes up literally in historic examples of fruitarianism where, you know, there was one guy who said women could achieve Madonna-like purity if they just ate fruit enough. And then it also comes in in a way where it's, it's sort of like a harmful way to think about food where you start to think about food as being good or evil or off limits or on when in reality, a healthier way to think about food, at least from the dietitians I talked to, was not to impose those kind of labels on it and to not have an all or nothing mentality around food. Um, and then second, I think there is a thread for me of evangelism in these religions or the subsects of the I don't want to say all of Christianity or all of fruitarianism it's just these sort of little pockets of them where some people start to feel like this is the only way you can live and be a good person and since this worked for me I need you to also be on board with it and so I think there's some of that that happens very interesting now, the, the, again friends this goes in this book goes into some amazing stuff and another part she gets into and I never even thought of this is that, and I want to make sure I'm saying this correctly, there's a, a people who believe that vegan societies uh, were colonial, white centers, and elitist. And uh, even there was an essay about the vegan race wars and how mainstream ignores vegans of color. Let's get into that a little bit. What did we find out about vegetarian or fruitism and, and, and all this stuff? Yeah, so I wish I had more time in the book to go into it. I think there's probably another book out there that does this better. But something I became interested in was just why was this particular strand of fruitarianism so white? It was and it predominantly made of thin white women. That was the major base of this group. Um, and so I wanted to just get into was there like a systemic reason for this or was it just a fluke that this had happened? And from the reading that I included in the book, I think it's part of a larger issue where there is like a faction of vegan veganism that's sort of known as like white veganism, where there is a lack of awareness about in issues that intersect with veganism that could be really helpful for, for people to take a look at. I never knew there'd be a difference between white veganism and black veganism. I thought it'd be all one veganism. I didn't I didn't realize that. I think veganism is kind of like religion in a way, or at least that's how I think of it, where I, I don't ever want to say like all of veganism or all of fruitarianism. It's kind of like different churches, different sects, different, you know, small groups, different like people who have their own individual varying beliefs within a greater system. And so it's not a monolith, but it is interesting to think about the different different parts that exist. Did you see that also in your research, uh, that it was pretty much white people who were preaching and, and, and addicted to the uh, fruitarianism uh, lifestyle? At least historically, yes. And in my in this particular 30 minute as a day group, yes. There are certainly different factions that exist outside of those. But in the very, very small part that I looked at, that would that was true. So it, do you think it becomes... An, and I don't, you're not an expert in this, obviously, but do you think it becomes a body image, uh, the difference between the races and ethnicities as a body image problem that white people want to be very thin? Uh, and maybe that's not the same thing with a, an Asian or Hispanic or a, a, a black person? I think, well, looking back, I use Sabrina String's book in terms of doing research. And she writes about, she, her book is called Fearing the Black Body. And she writes about how in the early 1900s, white women wanted to sort of separate themselves from black women by having thinner frames. That was like a way of physically separating themselves. And so I think that when I look at how much has carried up into present day, some of those issues and the thorniness of those issues still perpetuates today. So I think that that's like the strand I was taking a look at. 
a lot of those vegetarian, fruitarian people are not listening to Baby Got Back. Huh? They're not really uh, getting into <laughs> getting into that song, okay? They want to be skinny. <laughs> it was funny because the other day I was I was just going through some some photos I found, and there was one of Twiggy. Now, you probably never heard of Twiggy, but she was this model from England back in early, mid-60s, and she was as skinny as a rail, you know? And she and at the time, people said, oh, my word, you know what? Uh, look how bad she looks. And now it's like that's that we're going more and more that we went to that uh, that body style. It's uh, really something. Well, you know, the, the other thing that interests me about this is that the— uh, the Banana Island. We got to a place called Banana Island. Friends, if you haven't found it, Jacqueline's going to tell us, where is Banana Island? <laughs> it's not a real place. So oh. It does sound fun. <laughs> it's just this belief that like, you can start. It's kind of like a, a cleanse that they offer where you could just eat bananas and only bananas for days on end. Um, and it was a way of they believed it was a way of like clarifying your mind and your body because you didn't have to think about food at all. You were just supposed to be able to like eat the bananas. And so that was what that came from. Wow. That's, that's really, let me ask you a question. When, when the video's off, when they're not recording, do you think they're eating 30 bananas a day? You think they were doing that? I don't know. It's a great question. I think there's been a lot of different sort of reveals of vegans being caught eating other things. That's like a genre of YouTube video that exists. And I think that's one of the problems with social media is that it sort of forces this like narrow look at what you can or should be doing. And to break that open means losing followers or losing your identity. And so it's hard for people to have like shape shift, I guess, as they go or evolve. Now, the people we're talking about, and we're not bringing up them a lot here, but they have names, their handles, whatever they are, their identity, Freely, F-R-E-E-L-E-E, -E -E, and Durian Rider. Now, who are Freely and Durian Rider? So they're the creators of the 30 Bananas a Day website, and they're Australian. They're from Australia. Um, they were a couple who met because they were both on online raw, raw food forums back in the day. And they were both struggling with different things health wise, which I think is why I empathize and relate to them a little bit in the beginning of the book, at least, where they were both on sort of journeys to find better versions of themselves when they found fruit for the first time. And I think when they started the diet, they really did have this sense of wonder of like, this is amazing. I feel great. I'm a new person. And they, they felt this sense of joy at having found this diet. And so then they wanted to share it with other people through their website. Now, did they become a couple? They did, yeah. They were together for, I don't know exactly how many years. I want to say like close to a decade. They made YouTube videos together for years and years on end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is that you, you go in, you go to, you're able to talk to them. And they'll still talk with you about what went on and everything else with the lifestyle and then what changes and the raw food thing. And so interesting people. I mean, I might not agree with them, but they certainly were interesting. Yeah, they're very interesting couple and very interesting ideas on eating and on the body for sure. Now, one thing that I couldn't quite figure out, I, maybe I'm, I wasn't paying detailed attention. Did they, were there lawsuits involved? Were there litigation at all? And, and, and if there was- They had a lot of lawsuits. They- okay. At one point, Durian Ryder's blog said something like, five lawsuits haven't shut this blog down. He was kind of like proud of his lawsuits that had been raised against him. But yeah, they, they got into a feud with another fitness YouTuber at one point, um, and that went to court in Australia. And um, there were some others, but I really, I can't even remember what they are now. But they, Durian Ryder kind of prided himself on like having dialogue with other people. <laughs> You know, one of the other things that's interesting is you went through that history of uh, vegetarian or fruitarianism, and there was a doctor down in uh, Florida who I think had uh, was one of the early proponents, and I think he he had some of his patients die on in this diet. Yes, yeah. So he, yeah, he was he wrote a book called Eighty Ten Ten, which is sort of known as the Bible of uh, fruitarianism in some circles, and he 
was a chiropractor who gave nutritional advice. He claims he didn't give nutritional advice. So I should say that in terms of legally. But in court, the defendant said that or the whoever it is bringing up the claim said that they did. He did give them nutritional advice. And yes, two people died after receiving care from him in different forms um, that I go into in the book. And then he left America and went to a, a somewhere animal. Yeah, he like, he practices in Costa Rica and you can still fast with him today for I think it's like eight thousand dollars. You can okay. do that. So yeah. he got out of Dodge where they could bring suits against him. Now he's somewhere else. Yes. Ah, yep. yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. It's out there, <laughs> friends. It's out there. I'm telling you what, dieting is a problem. Uh, if you saw me, you saw a person, you see a person who should have dieted a heck of a long time ago and didn't. And uh, diet, not necessarily eating, but lifestyle. That's the whole thing, you know, and that's, they never balanced it. It was all fruit. And, but then, but then, then that changed a little bit. Tell us a bit of how that went to what's called as RT4. What is RT4? Yeah. So I was obsessed with the fruit diet when it was, you know, all fruit. And then people have asked me, you know, what caused you to kind of wake up and realize that it wasn't something great to follow. And one of the things that helped me wake up was Freely and Durian Rider transitioned without, they kind of told people, but it was kind of like in a guarded YouTube video um, that they had pivoted to something called raw till four, as you say. And basically that meant that after 4 p.m. you could eat cooked food. So you could eat boiled potatoes, boiled corn pasta. You could have low fat marinara sauce. But in my mind, when I when I think back on it, I remember thinking, why at 4 p.m.? Like, what about your stomach changes at precisely 4 p.m. that allows you to suddenly digest cooked food when they had said for years it was toxic and bad and going to hurt you? And then now they were saying, oh, it's actually really healthy and it's good and you can heal yourself. So I kind of started to see like maybe there's hypocrisy or maybe they don't actually have, you know, a reason for this. Right. And and then that led them into having conflicts with other people in the fruitarian world. I don't even think they were kicked out of societies. If I'm not, was there such they a were, thing? Is that? They were kicked out of a... a a retreat called called Woodstock, so which is exclusively raw, and so they were kicked out for eating boiled potatoes, which I like you think is kind of funny because it's these like dramas that really shouldn't be dramas at all. It is, it is. You know, everybody tries different types of diets. I know some people have been successful at one type of diet. I know someone very near to me right now has been on the carnivore diet for six, seven months, and has had amazing results. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think 50, 60 pounds they've lost, and that's pretty amazing to me. I, I need to lose 100. I should go on that too. But uh, but no, it's it's interesting that, that there are different people out there. And again, you will find something for everybody out there, and yet nobody wants to talk about eating less or doing it on a, on a moderate scale or doing it, you know, you have to have a balanced diet. Don't, it's not sexy. No one's talking about that. Right, right. Now, one of the things that happened is you start feeling better. You set some personal the goals or, or I should say re records for your time. And then you decide to go to Peru. Now that I don't got that. <laughs> what, why would you go to Peru in the midst of all these problems you've been having? So I was healthy for a year and a half before I went to Peru. Like I had had no episodes. I was, I ran a marathon. I was going to college like anyone else. I, you know, everything in my life was, back to normal. And for me, having been, you know, back to normal for a year and a half, I started to feel like I could have hope moving forward that I could just live a normal life. So I asked my neurologist if I could go to Peru and he said yes. And so that gave me confidence too to think that I was cleared to go. And I, yeah, so I, I went mostly just because I wanted to have a normal college experience. And I thought, I was back to normal. I thought I was, I thought I was like fully back to being healthy again. I hadn't realized there was a year and a half in there. I thought maybe not a few months, but okay. So that's something you ever consider going back home to your parents in Oklahoma to uh, stay with them and leave the, the college. Yeah. So that the first time I got sick, my freshman year, I did not want to go home at all because 
I think I was in denial at the time that something bad was actually happening because everyone around me, my coach, the doctor was saying I was normal. And so I didn't want to believe otherwise if I didn't have to, because I I don't think any 18 year old wants to believe you're going to have like a chronic health condition. That's not, (laughs) you know, not something that's uh, fun to think about or something that you want. Definitely the second time I got sick, we talked about that. And my parents told me to stay in college because they thought that I would suffer emotionally if I came home. Just I wouldn't have my friends who I had been friends with for years. I wouldn't have my hospital that was just down the road from my college apartment. So they made that decision, which was a really difficult one for both of us. Like, I don't think I don't know what the right answer was at that time or if we did the right thing. But I think they tried to make their best guess based on what they knew. And I tried to make mine based on what I knew. And that's what we came to. I know that at one time you were getting some tests done uh, at Duke. And I know they throw you a battery of tests. And and yet at the same time, I've had uh, I've heard wonderful things about uh, the University of Oklahoma and their uh, medical facilities there. Matter of fact, my daughter at one time was thinking of going there to take up medicine. Again, they found out she shouldn't be in the science department either. Go over to philosophy and something else. So, uh, but you know that we, we were there. We we toured the campus of OU. I was very impressed with the facilities and the people and everything else. But you you get tied into your doctors and your hospital where you're at and your friends and who are no longer in your Christmas list. And uh, that's okay. You know I understand that. But it, again, and you're still a young girl. You're nineteen, twenty. You know. Ay, 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 yeah, ay. looking back, you have a whole lot more wisdom than you do when you're in the situation, especially when you're that young. Now, let's talk. Are you, you just tell everybody, how are you feeling now? That's the most important thing to me. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm fantastic. I, yeah, doing everything I want to do and feeling great. So can't complain. Okay. And, and folks, we have not edited this. She hasn't said the same words over and over and over again. This has been one continual flow here. So lovely lady to have this conversation with. I, I'm so enjoying this. But uh, me too. Has it been ever fully gotten a diagnosis for the, for the problem? Yeah. So I've received answers that have helped me, and I've received different treatment plans that have really helped me and changed the way that I'm able to live. I'm not comfortable getting into those specifics. Oh, no, I don't want you to know. But you- yeah, but it's it's very much it's something. It's so strange you know, publicizing the book now, because when you're writing this book, you have to go back and live in that time. And so it becomes very immediate. And I know it's very immediate to readers. And it, and for me, it's almost like an afterthought these days, I think, which is really nice place that to be is where very it's good. Thing I, I used to think about all the time. And now I think about sort of infrequently. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're, you're doing much better. And uh, again, you have to be if you're going to be teaching students. What, what classes do you teach at, at Westchester? I teach um, the freshman composition classes, like the first year writing. Mm-hmm. I teach those. And I also teach creative writing courses. So I oh, teach wonderful. intro to creative writing, nonfiction. It's really fun. I enjoy it. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. So now, can I can I assume that the 30 bananas a day diet, lifestyle, whatever, is kaput now? No one's doing that anymore? Seth, the pay. They have rebranded so many times. I couldn't tell you what they're calling themselves today. I think one of them is calling themselves a frugivore, um, which is just a new way of saying almost the same thing. I think that one of them might now just be pouring straight cane sugar into water and drinking that and calling it like a carb diet. They're 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 still out there. I think they've just rebranded, and I think that the Thirty Bananas Day Forum is is extinct. Are they making a lot of money off of this? That's the question that comes to my mind. Uh, how much money are they doing? Enough to live on for the last decade, which I wasn't able to figure out financials because I couldn't talk to Freely and Durian Rider themselves. But they have accounts on every platform. They have millions of views on some of their YouTube videos. They have regular viewers. Even if it's just sort of like reactionary viewing, they still get the clicks. So, um, yeah, that's fascinating to think about, especially when you think about, like, are they responsible for the health of other people? I would say as soon as you're making money to last a decade on, you kind of are responsible at that point for more than just, hey, you should try this thing. Well, now tell me, what's next for Jacqueline Allness? Where where are you doing next? You're writing a book right now or you go, where are you? What are you doing? Are you just concentrating on teaching? 
Honestly, yeah, I feel like this has been a huge undertaking, which has been really fun, but hard balancing this plus teaching four classes. Like I told you, fiction is alluring only because I <laughs> the fact checking legal really took it out of me. So we'll see if there's a novel in the future at some point. Well, I certainly hope so. I'm going to be looking for it. I'll tell you, you've been wonderful. You're 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 a lot of fun. I really appreciate your book. You are telling us all about the problems of the fruit cure, and there's no one thing that's going to work for each and every person. And there may be somebody who does well with fruit, but 99.8% are not going to be doing well and just eating fruit. So uh, anyway. <laughs> That's a great way to sum it up. All right. Jacqueline, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us today on Books and Looks. Thank you so much. I really appreciated this conversation. All right, friends, we'll be right back. Again, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for being with us today and this really interesting look at fruitarianism and the people who are behind it, especially that 30 bananas a day diet and then raw till four and how things change and i don't know what's going on out there but there's a lot of strange stuff out there folks and you know there may be one or two people who get help but most people get no help or relief despite all the claims that are out there so anyway i hope you enjoyed this this is a wonderful wonderful uh, interview a great book an easy to read book and uh we're very happy that jacqueline herself is in remission no one's really tell her what's wrong with her that's the thing but she She's doing okay now, and she's a professor, and God bless her. So, hey, listen, on behalf of ViewsOnBooks.com, on behalf of the good friends at Podcast Studio X, this is Blaine DeSantis for Books and Looks, saying, may all your leaves be pages in a book. <laughs>